Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, our first class in our Forerunner School called Understanding the Forerunner Call. And as you can imagine, we're very excited about both the class and the school itself. I really do sense that it's a tremendous, there's a tremendous urgency in this hour to uh, raise up forerunners uh, that will operate in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so we're excited about the fact that the Lord has invited Life School and uh, myself and Brian and others to be a part of that effort to raise up forerunners. And I'm excited that you're either watching this or listening to it uh, online. Uh, it shows that you have an interest in this. And so uh, we're really excited about it. Um, in this class, I'm just give a start out with giving an overview of the class uh, that we're, you've, this is the first session of, is understanding the forerunner call. Uh, what we want to do in this class is just set the foundation for the entire school. We'll be speaking about the, uh, what the forerunner call is. We'll go into, into a lot of depth to define uh, what it is, the function of it, the message of it. Uh, and then we'll look also at some of the roles and some of the ways that forerunners will operate. Uh, we'll talk about the spirit and the power of Elijah. We'll talk about a number of things. And so we're really uh, excited about it, and I hope you'll enjoy it as well. One of the things I want to really encourage you to do with this is that we're not trying to make this another uh, preaching type session or uh, teaching session as you would have on a Sunday morning as you gather together in worship. We're looking at this as a school uh, where, where, you would tr where you would be trained to be forerunners, to be raised up as forerunners. And so in order for that to happen, both with this class and with the entire school, is there's really a need for you to uh, jump into the depth of the scriptures that we'll be bringing out uh, in the various sessions in this class and all the classes for we all know that probably most everybody who's watching this has been in church for a number of years and you know you can hear a message on Sunday morning and you can be stirred you can be encouraged you can be challenged but you really don't know the message to the point where you could communicate it and be a voice and this is about more than just um, being encouraged or being challenged this is about raising you up as a voice uh, in this generation, wherever you may be, uh, whether it's uh, where we are in America or, or really anywhere around the world, the Lord wants to raise up forerunners who are voices in this hour to the, what is going on in the world. We'll be talking in this session uh, about this. But I really want to encourage you to dig into, dig into the scriptures because if you don't really get into the word yourself and meditate on it and uh, and read the notes and d dig into all of this, you'll not really get the message deep into your heart where you can really be a voice. And that's the, that's the purpose of it. So I really want to encourage you uh, to do that uh, as we uh, get started. Now, in this session is called As It Was in the Days of Elijah, and we'll get into that in a minute. But I do want to just read the two foundational scriptures that we'll be drawing from uh, in throughout the class and really for um, uh, you know it'll be the foundation for really everything that we do so we'll get into that let me just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and take control and then we'll then we'll read those scriptures and get into discussing as it was in the days of Elijah so father we thank you for the group that's here we thank you for the group that'll be watching this and we ask father for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon it I pray that you would take me out of the way, and this would be the voice of the Lord speaking to those you love, those who you have called to be forerunners, anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So the two foundational scriptures that, and I'm not going to turn to them, I have them in the notes just to save some time. I'll turn to a few scriptures and we'll just reference others. But the two foundational scriptures for this class are one, uh, the book of Malachi, specifically Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And let me read it from the New King James. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful or great and terrible 
day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And so we're going to be dealing with the Lord sending Elijah before the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And then the other scripture verse, which has been actually our theme verse for our local church and for life school for uh, decades, really, and it's Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and reading from the New American Standard. Uh, and he, talking about John the Baptist, will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedience disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord and so we'll be drawing from those in fact uh, starting with next uh, session session two for uh, four sessions uh, after this one we'll be looking in depth at these two scripture verses to try to dissect them and to analyze what it means by turning the hearts of the people back to God, by making ready a people prepared for the Lord, what it means to operate in the spirit and the power of Elijah. But in this session, I want to just set a foundation for the days uh, in which Elijah came, the days in which John the Baptist came, and to show you that these, we're living in very, very similar days. So let's begin with that as we look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, we'll start, with, uh, we'll start with verse 31, I believe. This is right before Elijah comes on the scene, talking about Ahab uh, and Jezebel. Uh, and in fact, let me start with uh, uh, verse 29. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Now, remember that. We're going to be looking at that in just here in a minute. The sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and to worship him. And so he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And he also made the Asherah, the, that thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And there had been uh, quite a uh, number who had provoked the Lord. But the Lord, is as though as when this all happened, it was a, as though the Lord had said, okay, th I've had enough. I've had enough with this. In verse, chapter 17, verse 1, it starts out with, now Elijah, now Elijah. Uh, in the context of what was going on in Israel, this is the northern kingdom of Israel. At this point in time, they had divided between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and uh, when Ahab got to that point where all this was happening, God said, okay, I'm raising up Elijah. I'm, now it's time for Elijah. And a lot, the solution, God's solution uh, for all that was going on was to raise up uh, a forerunner, uh, Elijah, uh, who operated obviously in the spirit and the power of Elijah to confront these issues and to bring the church back uh, to God. And so this is the context we find ourselves in. Just let me just share. This is what the Lord put on my heart uh, even as I was uh, preparing to come over to record and to uh, teach these, uh, this session, the Lord put on this in my heart, and I know this to be the case, uh, that the sins of Jeroboam are in the church today, in the American church for sure, in the European church, in the uh, African church, really throughout the nation. The church is committing the sins of Jeroboam. So we're going to look at those in just a minute. But in addition to, to that, not only are, is the church participating in the sins of Jeroboam, we have governmental structures. This is definitely true in America, and I think it's true in many, many other places, that the governmental structure is functioning much like Ahab did uh, with an anti-Christian or anti-God agenda uh, in this hour. And 
that Jezebel, the Jezebelic culture that was there during the days of Elijah and the days of Ahab is present in the earth today. And so here we have it. The sins of Jerobo Jeroboam are, are in the church, but the government and the culture is trying to make even that trivial in comparison to what they're trying to do. Because what, they're, what the go our government, the global government, is they move towards a globalist agenda. They are trying to push mainstream, uh, God-honoring, Christ-honoring Christianity out of the world system. And God's solution to that is to raise up Elijah's forerunners who will be anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah uh, to turn people back to God and then to use that group to stand strong with a standard of righteousness and to, and to war in the spirit, intercession, through intercession and spiritual warfare against these issues that are coming against uh, the world. And so that's the day in which we live right now. That's the day we are in now. We are living in the days of Elijah. There was that song that came out in the 90s, I guess it was. Uh, these are the days of Elijah. And they were then too, but they are really, we are really in the days of Elijah right now. And that's what this class is about and this school is about, is to raise up forerunners anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah who can be used to turn the church uh, back uh, to the Lord and to make ready a people prepared for the end times and prepared uh, for the return of the Lord. So let's look at let's look at 1 Kings chapter 12. We want to look at the sins of Jeroboam a little bit. And then we, what we want to do is I want to look at uh, the sins of Jeroboam and the life of Ahab and Jezebel a little bit. And then we'll look at John the Baptist for a moment. And then we'll compare, compare it to where we are uh, today. So if you look at 1 Kings chapter 12, um, here's the setting. Uh, Solomon has died. Uh, Jeroboam had tried to rebel against him during his lifetime, and he had gone to Egypt, so he's coming back. Rehoboam uh, is uh, the other candidate for, to be the king to succeed Solomon. And so anyway, there was a lot of uh, turmoil there, and what happened was that Jeroboam... Uh, set off into the northern kingdom and took a number of the tribes with him. So, we, so this is the beginning of the division between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Prior to that, during the reign of Solomon, they were united as one kingdom. And so Jeroboam uh, was trying to create a system of worship. Now what had happened is that the temple and the priesthood and all of the things that went along with the worship of Yahweh at that point in time were down in the southern kingdom in Jerusalem. And so uh, Jeroboam went up to the northern kingdom and he was trying to set up uh, a number of, of things. And so we start with verse 25 of 1 Kings chapter 12. And here's what we see. Then Jeroboam built uh, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim. This is the northern kingdom and lived there. He went out from there and he built a Penuel and Jeroboam said in his heart, listen to this, now the kingdom will return to the house of David if these people go up, he's talking about going up to Jerusalem uh, to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people ret will return to their Lord and he's not speaking about God here, he's speaking about uh, the king to Re Rehoboam, the king of Judah. And then he says, they will kill me, and they will return to the Rehoboam king of Judah. So the king consulted, and he made two golden calves, and he said to them, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan, which is really the very northern part of Israel at that time. And he made houses on the high places, and he made priests among all the peoples who were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar 
Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the cows which he had made, and he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even in the month which uh, he had devised in his own heart. And he um, instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. So you can see what's happening. It's really, I think, probably becoming clear to you. You can really begin to see what's happening. And you see it in the day's church. He was afraid that if he allowed the people to go to Jerusalem, they would abandon him. And so he set up a, a religion of convenience and of compromise, of convenience and of compromise. He set up a new uh, priesthood that was completely out of the order that God had uh, ordained it to, or ad ordained for it. He created a different sacrificial system, a, wor a worship of a, a, a different place to offer incense. He created a, a different set of feasts. And so it was, he created a religion that was to facilitate himself. It was self-centered because he would say, if, if, I don't, if I keep it the way it was, I'm going to lose the people. Uh, he created a system that was convenient. It's too much trouble to go all the way down to Jerusalem now. You just kind of worship this way. So it was convenient, it was self-centered, it was convenient, and it was made out of compromise, totally separated from the word uh, of the, the scriptures that the Lord had given uh, to Israel, even going back to the, their time in the wilderness. And so what do we see here? We see that Jeroboam created his own religious system, his own uh, structure uh, in, in, in the land uh, to keep people from drifting away from him. Now, you know, it doesn't take a rocket science just to know this is happening a lot in America and in Europe and in uh, many other, every, uh, every, in fact, every, everywhere that we know people and have relationship with, it's happening all uh, around. This is a characteristic of, this, of, the, of where the church is, a lot of the church. It's in compromise, it's built around the exaltation of uh, those in leadership, and uh, it's made a, a religion of convenience rather than of pursuing the Lord with all their hearts. And so uh, we see that the sins uh, of Jeroboam are in the church, but we also see that, on, that also Ahab and Jezebel have come on the scene as well. Uh, and just like it said in 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, that what Jeroboam had done was, a to was just trivial in comparison to what Ahab and Jezebel uh, were doing and, were, and were go wanted to do. And so that's where Elijah comes on the scene. So let's look at the, the sins of Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, uh, as, we have as we apply it to our present day situation in the world, that our governmental systems are, are for the most part anti-Christian. And they're trying to push the church out of the mainstream of, of the culture, out of the mainstream of, the, of life, and they're creating a, a, a Babylonian type of culture uh, with, where immorality and all sorts of evil and compromise uh, things are taking place. And so it's in this setting uh, that Elijah comes forth. Um, so let's look at the, uh, let, let, me, let me say this before we move to um, Ahab and Elijah. Let's talk about golden calf worship because this is going to be really uh, important as we get into looking at what Ahab and Jezebel uh, had done. Golden calf worship, uh, in that day, uh, a lot of the uh, religious expression, whatever, was to create a, a, a bull uh, with a, the picture or the thought of an invisible God riding upon it. And so when Jeroboam set up golden calf worship, he was not attempting to create a, a worship system uh, totally separate from the worship of, worship of Yahweh. He was trying to add 
something that would give them something tangible to hold on to rather than the internal invisible God. Uh, but he was not trying to put in an entirely new uh, worship system that worshiped a totally different God. That was the golden calf worship. But we'll see in a minute that when Elijah came on the scene, uh, I mean, when Ahab came on the scene, he tried to do something uh, very, very uh, different. So let's talk about now for, about the rule of Ahab uh, and Jezebel. Uh, the reign of Ahab and Jezebel led Israel into great depths of corruption uh, and depravity. Uh, Ahab was, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, he was a, a very weak king, but he was also a, a strong king, and he was trying to expand the political influence of Israel in that day. And so he married Jezebel, who was a, was a wedding of uh, convenience and a political alliance. Uh, Jezebel was heavily involved in the worship of Asherah and, and a leader in that. So it was a political union between uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Um, and so they were trying to expand the, the, their kingdom uh, politically and through these alliances. But they had a lust for power. Uh, they were trying to ha have uh, uh, power that went along with their, uh, their call and their, their roles. Uh, but in, in that, uh, they acted corruptly. They acted very uh, uh, corruptly. We see that. Uh, let's go. Uh, I probably won't read all this. It's too much uh, to read. But 1 Kings chapter 21 we see this with Naboth's vineyard, uh, their, their corruption and their, their, their evil and their, uh, the way they acted corruptly. Naboth owned a vineyard near where Ahab's palace was. And Ahab wanted that vineyard for, for a vegetable garden. But, the, uh, but Naboth had received that as an inheritance from uh, the Lord and the, the law said you can't get rid of what you've been given as an inheritance. You can't sell it to another tribe or whatever. And so Ahab was depressed about all of that. And Jezebel said, why? you know, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but, but she was saying to, to Ahab, why are you depressed? You're the king. Uh, if you want this vineyard, we'll take it. And so she devised a, an evil a scheme and raised up some worthless men, it says. Uh, and these worthless men lied about Naboth and they took him to court or whatever and they, uh, they were allowed to murder him. So Naboth was murdered and then Ahab stole his inheritance uh, and it took it for a vegetable garden. And this was, th this was a major issue that Elijah dealt with. In fact, Elijah said to Ahab and to Jezebel, because of this, in, in, this situation, this instance, because of it, you're going to, uh, we're going to take away your, uh, your line, your entire line. They'll be obliviated and Jezebel will be killed. And Ahab repented. Um, and so the Lord said, well, Ahab, because of that, I'm not going to kill you. But your line, after you die, your line will be taken away. And we'll see that, uh, Eli that uh, Jehu did that a little bit later. But there's a, there was a corruptness uh to it, a compromise and a, and a corruption. Now, Ahab was trying to walk a little bit of both ways, it seems like, because he had named his children after Yahweh, uh, but yet he was deceived and he was pulled by Jezebel uh, into this situation. So there was corrupt uh, action that went along with this. And so we, we see this verse of scripture. This is in the, the context about Naboth's vineyard, vineyard. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. He acted very abominably 
in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the sins of uh, before the sons of Israel. So you see, there was a real corruption in their leadership, and there's a seduction from Jezebel into that. Um, Ahab and Jezebel led Israel into great religious compromise, even pagan worship. Uh, and this was, uh, this is a really important thing because, I mean, it's not a good thing, importantly, but it's a, it's a, it's a real issue, and we face a lot of this today. Like I said before, Jeroboam had compromised. Uh, he, had ra he had built uh, idols of, of golden calves, so there was a real compromise in his, um, in his leadership as king, but Ahab and Jezebel took it to an entirely new level. They introduced, as we read in a few minutes ago in 1 Kings 16, they introduced the worship of Baal and the Asherah. And so, whereas Jeroboam had compromised with the, the worship of Yahweh, Ahab and Jezebel instituted an entirely new religion, an entire the worship of an entirely new entity, an entirely new god, Baal and Asherah. There was nothing con with Baal and Asherah. There was nothing at all connected to the worship of Yahweh. Whereas the golden calves, even though wrong, even though idolatry, were intended to be aids to the worship of Yahweh. Uh, and so this was a major issue uh, uh, in the land. Uh, and so let me read this from, this is David Davis, who wrote in his book, The Elijah Legacy. David Davis, he's gone on to be with the Lord now, but uh, he and his wife had a church that was established in, on Mount Carmel, you know, where the confrontation took place between uh, Elijah and, and Ahab and Jezebel. They had a church there uh, in Israel. And he wrote this in his book about, uh, about Baal. Uh, Fires would be stoked in the open bellies of the metal idols. That we're talking about Baal. The priests of Baal would then take the firstborn sons from the Israelite women and throw the infants into the fire in the stomach of the idol. As the mother screamed in horror, the false prophets of Baal would dance, shriek, bang on musical instruments, cut themselves with knives, and cry out to their god. These altars uh, to Baal were built on the high places of Galilee, alongside child sacrifice. Organized ritual, prostitution, and homosexuality were sanctioned and encouraged. Asherim, or fertility poles, were set up in the homage to Asherah, the wife of Baal in Canaanite mythology. Uh, and so what you can see is that Ahab and Jezebel were, were basically trying to push the, the worship of Yahweh, of the one true God, to push them out of the culture completely uh, and establish an entirely new worship system. Uh, it would be like this in America to some degree, where we have freedom of religion, but the, the, the nation was founded upon the belief in Christianity. And Christianity was kind of like the, the God of America. But there would come a president or a government who would say, we're pushing this out uh, so that something like Islam or Hinduism or, uh, you know, just atheism or... Uh, you know, some of the uh, worship of man, communism, socialism, those would become the gods that we would worship. So that was what was happening in the land uh, at that point in time, is that whereas Jeroboam had led the people into compromise, uh, Ahab and Jezebel were trying to push that expression completely out of the land and make it illegal or very difficult uh, to worship in, in, in that way. Uh, and so there, there was a lot of religious compromise there, um, or, or opposition there. Um, and, you know, out of that came uh, 
a great opposition and persecution to the true worship of the Lord. Because you see that, not only did they in, install that and say, hey, you have your choice. You can worship Baal or you can worship Yahweh. They weren't saying that. They were trying to persecute the worship uh, of Yahweh. You see it in um, a, a number of places in this in, encounter with Ahab and Jezebel. You see it, uh, you know, Ahab, Jezebel, Elijah goes to Ahab and Ahab says, is this you, you troubler of Israel? In other words, you were, he was creating all kinds of uh, opposition to that. But you see it where with Naboth's vineyard, but you see it also where Jezebel was trying to uh, eliminate the prophets. She was killing the prophets. In fact, Obadiah had hidden some, a lot of the prophets in caves because Jezebel and Ahab were trying to, uh, to kill them. And so it was a lot more than it was a lot more than just you have a choice. You can worship Baal or you can worship Yahweh. They were trying to push out the worship of Yahweh, the true worship of Yahweh, uh, uh, into uh, out of the out of the land completely and institute an entirely new uh, religion. And so. The condition in the land caused the people to remain silent and in compromise. Listen to this scripture verse. This is from 1 Kings chapter 18, 20, verses 21 and 22. Now Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And listen, listen to what happened. But the people did not answer him or did not answer Elijah a word. And Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet in the Lord, but the, but the Baal's prophets are 450 men. And so here, here's, here's the point here is that this opposition, whether and the, and, and to go and alongside the compromise and the the, the true religion of the hour in that land led the people to be silent. They, would, they were, they were going to just go along with what the government, the king and the queen were doing and the culture. They were fitting right in with all of that. Uh, so they were remaining silent. Uh, and one more point about it, about the reign of Ahab and Jezebel the compromise in their religion caused also a, a, just a compromise, a, a, a sexual, immoral culture in the land. Because the worship of Asherah uh, was very, very evil. Let's, uh, let me just read a scripture verse from 1 Kings 14. Of course, this was before, uh, and this was referring again to the southern kingdom, and it was before Elijah came on the scene. Um, Verse 23 and 24. For they also built for themselves high places and sacred pillars and ashram. Oh, this ashram was the religion, uh, the fertility goddess religion that Jezebel was pushing. On every high hill and beneath every luxuriant tree. In verse 24. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They, that was part of the Asherah worship. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed from the sons of Israel. So part of Asherah worship, and this was also part of uh, Baal worship as well, as all was connected. There was uh, sexual immorality and ritualistic prostitution that was a part of the worship because they believed as there was the sexual union between the priest and the priestesses and and those created good harvests and prosperity uh, in the land. And so uh, there was a, a prevalent sexual immorality that was there just in the worship of this. And you could see, though, you could see this in Jezebel as, as well, that even when Jehu came on the scene, she, one of the things she did was she painted her eyes. In other words, she was trying to seduce him with her flattery to save her life. And so... You see in this uh, atmosphere that there's uh, a great attack coming from 
the government and the culture against the, the religious establishment, the true religion uh, in the land. You see this conflict. Uh, it's compromise. It's uh, persecution. It's the pushing of uh, an immoral culture. Uh, and it's uh, persecution and even uh, martyrdom or murder that was taking place. And so th this is the setting that took place, it was there, when Elijah came on the scene. Uh, and he, his goal was to turn the people away from all of this, the worship of Asherah, the worship of Baal. His goal was to confront all this, but to first confront the people. Uh, and to confront the people and say, if Yahweh is God, worship him. In other words, come back to the true. <clears throat> come back to the real thing. That's what he was saying uh, to the people. And, uh, you know, eventually after the confrontation, there was a movement back to that. So Elijah uh, was successful. Uh, you know, I mean, it's never 100%, but, he, but people did turn back. Uh, to the Lord th through the confrontation between Elijah, uh, the people, uh, Ahab, and Jezebel. So this is the, the setting that was there. Now, you know, you can see, it's easy to see, wow, this is what's happening right now. This is happening in America right now. Uh, and so we'll summarize that more in a, in a minute. So you see, you see that in Elijah, but the same was true. We want to go now to, the, to John the Baptist. The same was true uh, in the days that Jesus was coming on the scene uh, as well. Uh, you know the story. The Elijah, I mean, John the Baptist was anointed, called as a forerunner of the spirit and the power of Elijah. And so he comes on the scene. Uh, his ministry started a few years before Jesus began his ministry. He was going out into the wilderness of Judea. And he was calling uh, the people, calling on the people to turn back to God. Same message that Elijah was using. You know, the kingdom of God is at hand. Return, repent. In other words, repent means turn back. Turn back to the Lord your God uh, and worship him. And he confronted, uh, he confronted the religious establishment. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, some of them went out there, and he called them a brood of vipers. He said, what brings you out here? Bring You bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, don't just give me lip service. Make it real. And so he was calling on them uh, to do that. He also confronted the uh, religious or the government of the, of the day. Uh, you know, at that point in time, they were under Roman uh, rule, and uh, Roman uh, government uh, was a very polythe polytheistic uh, religious type of thing, many gods, and the people were being forced, a lot of them were being forced to worship and to bow down before these uh, Roman gods in order to get jobs and to uh, have success, to be accepted into society. All of those kinds of things were happening. Uh, and for the most part, the Roman government would allow their, their, the people they had taken captive to worship their own god wherever, no matter where it was in the, in the world. And so they were allowing the Jews to have their own system. They were allowing uh, the Jewish religion to be practiced, although they did have the authority, the, the Roman governors did have the authority to act outside that policy and to uh, persecute or to stop or to, uh, to uh, kill even those who were practicing Judaism. And this, was, this is what happened with John the Baptist. He confronted Herod and he confronted Herodias because of the, all of their sin. And Herodias uh, danced before Herod and wanted uh, John the Baptist's head and, and on a platter. And so he was allowed legally to act outside the law uh, to, to kill him. And so we see this. We see the same thing happening in the, in the days leading up to Jesus' ministry. Now, John was, his ministry ended at about the time Jesus was coming out of the wilderness temptation. And 
we'll look at that at, at a later time. Uh, but, but, excuse me. Uh, but what what was happening was that uh, in that day we see it as the very same thing that happened uh, during the uh, during the days of John the Baptist and Herod. He was confronting the compromise in the religious system because the the Pharisees and the Sadducees had created a system that was uh, totally apart from even the Old Testament law and totally different from what Christ was wanting to bring in coming into the new time and into the new season. And so John the Baptist was confronting that, and he was also confronting the government. He was confronting the, the Roman government and the, and the culture represented by Herodias and the, uh, the, the sensuality and all that was there. Again, we see that when Jesus was, had come on the scene, when he was getting ready to start his ministry, the same environment, pretty much the same environment that was there during the days of Elijah was there during the days of John the Baptist. And these are the days that we find ourselves in as well. These are the days that we live in. We live in the days, once again, the days of Elijah. What do we see? We see a, we see a, a church in compromise uh, a church of convenience. We, we see a church that is, for in many places, is promoting, uh, is self-promoting the people and the leaders more so than equipping the people. So we see a, a, a church that's blended into the culture in order to try to reach people in the culture. And I'm not trying to come against the church in, in any way, uh, I, you know, there, there are many people who are most, I would say, in America are sincere people, men and women of God, who want to lead the, the people into what needs to be. But there, there's a lot of compromise right now uh, in the American church and I think in the global church as well. And at the same time, you see the governments of the, of the nations trying to become more and more and more anti-Christian. Uh, you see them ruling out and restricting the true worship of God. You see them making laws uh, that would try to restrict uh, the, the worship. Right now, fortunately, in America, they're, they're not martyring Christians, but there's certainly persecution uh, of Christianity in a lot of ways. Uh, and you see the culture deteriorating. The, the worship of Asherah uh, we don't go to Asherah poles and worship them, but the same things are happening. Uh, sexual immorality, homosexuality, uh, all of that is taking place uh, all around the world. And so we see the culture just like it was during the days of Elijah uh, and also during the days of John the Baptist. We see the, the culture like that. We see the government trying to push Christianity more and more and more out of the mainstream, we see human sacrifice, just like there was at Baal worship, through the issues of abortion, and in some places, even to the point of birth or even beyond, uh, legalizing the murder of unborn and newly born children. So we see all of this taking place around the world, and we see the church in compromise, uh, blend, trying to blend in. You know, just to, as we close here in a moment, this has become, to me, and I think to a lot of us, so evident uh, in this beginning of this decade of the 2020s. And the Lord's been speaking to me, saying that what we're encountering now is, all, this is I'm teaching this in uh, June of 2020, so at the beginning of the, of the decade. And so... What is happening, what is going to happen, I believe prophetically, what is going to happen in the decade, this decade is going to be very turbulent. There's going to be a lot of issues coming up in a lot of ways. I think on one hand, God is trying to get the attention of the church to wake them up so they'll come out of compromise. But at the same time, the governments are using 
the turbulent times, the chaos that is going on uh, in the world right now to try to take away rights of, of the church and to be who God wants us to be while the culture is deteriorating. The culture is deteriorating more and more and more into immorality, into all sorts of issues of sin. Um, I was really surprised during this pandemic uh, and, and uh, the, the, the protests and the rioting that's going on right now. I was so surprised to see how the government was saying, churches, you can't meet. You can't meet over here. You can't meet. You've got too many people. You got over a hundred people. If you got over fifty people, you can't meet. But while they're doing that, they're allowing people to gather for a lot of other reasons. And so, what's happening? I believe this is a picture. God's trying to get the attention of the church to wake him up. But to look at the government, the government is anti-church, anti-assembly. You know, and they're saying, "Don't meet. Don't meet." And much of the church is is just going right along with it. Uh, I understand that there was a time and there was a season when that was probably the appropriate thing to do, but in my opinion, right now we're beyond that point. It's time for the churches to begin to meet, to gather, to come together in unity. And so we're living in those days right now. I was so impressed by the president of Tanzania, where we have a, a significant life school base there. He was saying well, the churches are going to be able to continue to meet because that's where the power is. It's true. That's where the power is in the church. But there's a lot happening in this decade. And God's solution, just like it was during the days of Elijah, just like it was when Jesus was beginning to come on the scene for his earthly ministry, we are now living in those days of Elijah. We're living in those days right now. And the Lord is saying, I'm raising up forerunners who will be anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the church back to a true worship of the Lord their God, to, to Christ, the person of Christ, away from compromise, away from seeker sensitivity, away from... Uh, focus on external signs and wonders to back to the man Christ Jesus. God is raising up forerunners to turn people back to that man Christ and then to, so that that church can be a standard of righteousness and a faithful witness into the deteriorating governmental structure that's opposing and will continue to oppose Christian, true Christianity and will try to cr continue to create an anti-Christian uh, culture that's immoral and, and anti-God in every way. God's solution to that, to all this stuff that's going on that's so similar to the days of Elijah and the days of John the Baptist is to, just like he did then, to raise up Elijah's. A, an Elijah company who will be ready, who, be, who will be prepared uh, hear that, to be prepared, who will understand the issues, who can communicate from the scriptures, who can speak as a voice into the church, into the governments, into the culture. That's the hour we live in. I have said yes to that. I said yes to that decades ago, and I've been on the journey ever since. We'll talk more about that in the next session. But he wants to raise up forerunners. He spoke to me back in December of 2019, right before we began to enter the de this decade of the 2020s. And he said, I want you to be like a, a Zacharias and Elizabeth. I want you to birth, they birthed John the Baptist. I want you to birth forerunners. That's the call he's given to me for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't know how long that'll be. I'm 73 years old right now. And I don't know how, how many more years he'll give me, but my call for this, from this point forth is to birth forerunners. I've got to be on that journey myself, and I am on that, and it will continue to be 
But he said to me, birth forerunners will be anointed in the spirit and the power of Elijah to, con to, to be a voice in the, in, the, in the culture and into the issues that are going to come in this decade. I've said yes to it. I am focused on building this forerunner school, which is the mechanism that the Lord has given to us to birth forerunners. And I think value time, the fact that you're listening to this, you have said yes, but I want to encourage you or anybody else who's listening to it who's not said yes yet to join me to say, Lord, make me ready as a forerunner, anointed in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord and to prepare the way for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Will you join me in that? Will you join me in that? I pray that you will. So before I pray, in the next session, we'll begin to look at uh, end time forerunners and then into the, the details of forerunners who are in the, empowered by the spirit and the power of Elijah. So join me in prayer. Father, we ask that everyone who is or will listen to this or watch it on the Internet will say yes to being prepared to be a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen.